chaplain programs work in the large departments. They work in the small departments, the career departments. How about that really tiny volunteer department, uh, career volunteer mix, they call it, you know, a combined department. Chaplain programs are significant, have an, a significant impact in those agencies, inside, outside, rural, uh, large city, small city. They're what your agency really could benefit from. You know, and let me say this. I have been the chaplain for 25 years. Large departments, small departments, as I train and give instruction, there hasn't been one agency that has regretted putting a chaplain, a, a qualified chaplain program in place, one that works in excellence, one where the chaplains are trained and understand what a, an agency chaplain should be, how they should manage that program. Uh, those chiefs, those leaders, they're thrilled to have a chaplain on deck. And every agency, from the smallest volunteer department to the large metropolitan department, every agency can afford to have a qualified chaplain in their midst. So what is a fire department chaplain? What does he look like? What does he smell like? Um, really, is he a listening ear? Yes. Could he be a spiritual guide? Yes. Is that chaplain a resource to the leadership in the agency? Absolutely. Uh, is he help to the hopeless? Is he help to those that are in traumatic uh, situations without any, any idea what to do? That's the chaplain. And we want to talk today about putting a chaplain together, a chaplain program together for you. But really, if there was a definition for a chaplain, I think he would be classified the officer of calm. The officer of calm fills the gap, just like you see on this photograph. That officer, no one knows what to do. It's an unexploded bomb territory. He's on a mission to make them safe, to feel secure as they transfer uh, from one side of the street to the other. He's going to keep it together for them. We're going to take a moment and talk about the elephant that is often in the room when chiefs and fire department leadership have private discussions behind the door regarding their chaplain program. So that elephant in the room is this. When chiefs and leaders have that discussion behind closed doors as they consider a chaplain program, the question they really ask is, is this, or the statement is this, I really don't want a preacher walking the halls of my department trying to save everyone's soul. The chaplain really is a connector. He's not a preacher. He shouldn't be a preacher in your agency, but what he should be, what she should be, is one that connects your agency personnel, your victims in crisis, get them connected to the right resources for them to grow, to, to manage their lives, to manage an event. And that chaplain, that officer of calm is the guy and gal that can do that for you. So the real question is, what does a chaplain do? If we have a chaplain in our agency, what would I expect from them? And there are two questions that every agency must answer. And really the first one is, do I want this chaplain, do I want my chaplain program to serve just the personnel inside my agency? Oftentimes I hear chiefs say these three things to me or to other chaplains as they're beginning their program. They say this, I don't wanna see my personnel on the divorce list, the alcoholic list, or the suicide list. Now chaplain, get out of my office and go get that done. So then the next question, is maybe the chief says, I really want my personnel to figure it out all on their own, but we need someone to help us with the victims out in the field. When their house is burning down, when their kids are in that car upside down, I need somebody to step in alongside of my medics, alongside of the, the firefighters that are uh, doing the triage and someone to help those citizens. I want a chaplain to help those folks. Or you want a chaplain that will work in both worlds the agency personnel, and the victims of crisis. So department personnel, when you talk to them, they are courageous warriors, so to speak. But in real life, they're moms and dads. They're people that fa face the same crisis, uh, but just as the provider of care. And in the middle of all of that, oftentimes the day gets long, the day gets weary. And if you note the, the, the photograph that we're seeing on our, on, our on our slides right now is me. That's the chaplain. I carry water in my pockets on a hot day, water for those firefighters when they take a break, making sure they're doing well, encouraging them that they can go back in that fire because we're not quite done. We have more work to do. And that's the role that we begin as a fire department chaplain. So how would a, a fire department chaplain really begin? What makes him an integrated part of every department? 
The chaplain starts with routine visits to a fire station or multiple stations. Short visits, I call it intentional loitering. You're in to make relationships, develop those times with firefighters so that they know who that chaplain is, they can trust that that chaplain cares about them genuinely, and then the chaplain, when he leaves, when she leaves, they leave a, a space. They oftentimes, I can tell you, send your chaplain out through the truck bay door, the side door. Many times a firefighter will follow them out with a, dis, with a need to have a discussion privately with that chaplain. People ask often, should I expect my chaplain to talk to me about God? Well, the general rule of thumb across all of uh, all of chaplaincy in the fire service world is this. Chaplains are not free to initiate religious discussion or the distribution of religious material without invitation. In other words, if a, a fire department personnel have a question about spiritual matters, religious events or things, they're free to ask the chaplain. And at that point, the chaplain is free to enter that discussion and chat with them at whatever level um, that, that firefighter would like that uh, discussion to go. We also want our fire department chaplains to engage in as many fire department family events, family uh, department life events. We want them to be part of that agency so that the personnel see them as a regular part of what goes on, someone they can trust, someone they know is a part of the world they live in, daytime and nighttime. Chaplains are always free to uh, officiate personal events such as weddings, funerals, um, all types of um, requests from personnel. Weddings for a chaplain are always the delight because they have so many other traumatic things they deal with. So as an old chaplain, let me do your wedding. It's too much fun. One of the other things you can always call on your chaplain to do is to visit any member of your agency or even their family if requested to do so when they're in the hospital or when they're separated from family. For any reason, they are there for those reasons. Something else you can ask your chaplain to be and you should expect them to be is strength and encouragement without hesitation uh, to any member of the department. Uh, oftentimes, that's just simple tailboard talk, as we call that. After a tough call, you'll see that fire chaplain sneak in the back of a fire station, doing a little face on face to face, a little look at my eyes. How are we doing? That was a tough call. You can expect your chaplain to be right there doing those things as well. And last but not least, one of the other things you could expect from your chaplain, and you should, is that he or she are available 24 hours a day seven days a week, as much as they are able to do so, to be there side by side with your agency and all of its personnel. So the next section we want to talk about is uh, critical to those citizens of your community, the people we serve, whether they are close in close proximity or those that are far out in a rural part of, of the U.S. or any other place we serve. And that is assistance to our victims. And we want to talk about five distinct things that a chaplain will provide for them. The first is a measure of encouragement. The second will be stabilization. The third is giving them direction. The next will be a, a piece of education. And then there's all the rehabilitation options that will be available to them. And we're gonna talk about those in length. So the first thing that that chaplain is expected to do by not only the personnel from the fire department, they're looking, they've called for the chaplain. They expect him, they expect her to step right in the middle and help manage those people that are victims, uh, those that are bystanders, those that are impacted. And the first thing that chaplain wants to do is step in in the middle of that crisis and offer words of encouragement, actions that will bring back that officer of calm component when victims find themselves in traumatic events, they need that thing to calm down, enter the chaplain. We wanna talk about stabilization. That means this, for me, when victims are in the middle, in the heat of the, of the moment, when the trauma is playing out, when you can actually feel the heat of the fire, when you can visually see uh, that medical event playing out in front of you, oftentimes victims want someone they're close to and they don't know what to do. So they want to call the world. They want to uh, tell the neighbors. They want to put it on. Last night, <laughs> a person that was with me wanted to Facebook the event as it was playing out. 
we as chaplains need to help stabilize that. We want to calm that down once again and bring it to a stable conclusion in the middle of their emotion. We want to bring them back on track. So a piece that's missing often for uh, victims of crisis, people that are caught up in a traumatic event, is what do I do now? They ask the questions kind of in this order. What's going to happen next? They're, they're at a loss. This is a world they've never dealt with. They have maybe never called 911 in their life. They want to know what will happen next? What will happen? How do I do this? Chaplain, that's where you're going to step up. The next thing I want to know is uh, maybe we have a medical event playing out in your home. The question they ask is, why are there policemen here? We're a loving family in a beautiful home. Why do I have men and women with guns and badges in my house? Why are they here? And the chaplain can help explain those things to them. Uh, oftentimes we hear this. Well, I watch NCIS more than anyone else in my block. I know exactly what's supposed to happen. Why isn't your medic group doing that? And then the last thing maybe is, oh, now what do I do? What do I do? Where should I go? And a chaplain, if he's doing his job, if she's doing her job, has uh, uh, the ability to help that citizen navigate that water. It's, again, their first time, and we can keep the boat afloat for them as we touch their life in the middle of crisis. We don't want our citizens and victims that are caught up in so much crisis to be unaware. So as a chaplain, I want to make sure that they're educated. What does that mean? Their house is on fire. I have them taken to a safe place, possibly under the tree, wherever is safe and out of the way. And they're going to ask, why is that fireman cutting a hole in my roof? Well, chaplain, go to, you know, chaplain should go to drill. I know why firefighters cut holes in roofs. I know a little bit about water come, why water comes out of one end of the hose and not the other. I am able to share those things with that homeowner in very small, slight detail, but enough to keep them satisfied. Um, oftentimes they will ask the question if it's a medical event and someone dies. Why aren't they going to do an autopsy? Again, I saw this on, you know, Hollywood knows best. I can help them understand why an autopsy is not done every single time. Or maybe their son is in a car, upside down in a ditch teetering on the edge, ready to roll. And the question to me as the chaplain is, why aren't they getting my son out of that car right now? Why are they waiting? What's going on? They need to take action. They need to hurry. I can help them with that, why that doesn't happen. The question really is, what are they waiting for? And I can help. So as a chaplain and as a leader putting a chaplain program together, find chaplains that are willing to engage in the training, people who can answer the questions in a, at a level that won't compromise the efforts of the medics and those uh, firefighters, those trained personnel, and yet satisfy the needs of those citizens that are captured by the traumatic event. And by the way, people ask me this, are citizens often put off or challenged by the fact that a chaplain is on scene? My response to them quickly is, I am here to walk you through what's happening on scene. My job is to make sure that we get this scene stable for my medics, for my firefighters, and to help you stay safe and out of the way. I never tell, I never engage in that, in that conflict of religion, uh, conflict of religious beliefs if there is conflict. But what we do instead is help to bring that thing to calm. And then as a connector, my duty then is to, if it is, appears that there is specific religious preference in the home or on scene, I am quick to ask them, would you like me to call or to touch base with a religious leader in your preference? And I have all those phone numbers in my uh, fire department vehicle, both daytime numbers and after hours so that I can call them. I make certain that I am uh, on a one-to-one, face-to-face good basis with those religious leaders in my community, even though they may not be in the same faith uh, train as myself, I can, I can contact them and say, someone from your faith is in crisis. Will you come and help us? And they are good to do that because I've developed relations. So you want to make sure your chaplain is willing to do that as well. He needs to be well-rounded and well-connected in your community. We'll take a minute and talk about rehabilitation on scene. Um, 
We start with the chaplain on that one rather than at the end. Chaplains need to know how to be a liaison for that victim with every agency, every uh, emergency service group. Maybe it's the Red Cross. Maybe it's a ministerial association. Maybe it's a local service provider group. But the chaplain needs to be engaged with those folks, know how to contact them 24 hours a day, seven days a week without compromise. He says, I assess this. I know what rehabilitation needs are present. Maybe it's a family that's burned out of their home. Maybe it's a a part of a city that has been flooded. Maybe it's part that's been cut off by high water. Any of those things. Maybe electricity has been severed or we have a natural gas explosion and a whole block needs to be rehabilitated. Enter the chaplain once again. He needs to be well-connected and able to find those resources and have them in his speed dial for those families. The one last little bit that a chaplain can do that's his or hers and it's theirs personally, and I would encourage every chaplain, every agency to do this. It costs them no money. It costs them just a little effort. And that's to have a stash or a cache in their vehicle of uh, water bottles, a few blankets, some stuffed animals. Maybe you can talk to your local retail store and have them give you some variable, uh, various sizes of flip-flop shoes and maybe hats or gloves. When people run from their home in the midst of fire, they will run uh, everywhere from buck naked to wrapped in their brother-in-law's clothes because that was the closest thing. We want to help them when they step out. Little kids, chaplain, have a badge for them. Deputize them. Make them the, earn the badge, of, the badge of bravery and you stick it on there and make them swear that they'll be brave all the time and they'll smile, they'll take that badge. That's your job, chaplain. Grow them. They're only four years old. They're really scared. Help them. Stuffed animals go a long ways in a car wreck. And so know those things, have those things, have some gloves, have a coat, have a blanket and be ready. Thanks. Okay, we don't have a chaplain program. Where do we begin? There are a couple of quick questions uh, that we need to answer at every level, no matter the size of your agency, and that is this. Should chaplains have specific training, and if so, what should we train them in? Uh, I don't want just the preacher from the corner. I don't want one uh, person who just has the ability to smile big. I really need them to be trained, and in what training should we make certain our chaplain has? And on your screen, you'll see a list and it runs from the Federation of Fire Chaplains. They have an essentials class. Uh, typically, that class will cost you about $175. Go to the Federation of Fire Chaplains website. You'll see those trainings across the U.S., across Canada. They're offered. I would encourage you, if you're putting your chaplain program together, make sure your chaplain gets to that class. It's two days. Pay his way, pay her way, and make sure they have that training. Uh, the next one is put on by the FBI. It's free online, and that's how to do a death notification because, unfortunately, chaplains will have to do that for on behalf of and for your agency, possibly, or if they share that duty with the police department, maybe they will go with an officer, but they need to know how to do that, and the FBI's information is on your screen. And chaplains, whether you're in a small town or large, you need to know that this day, it might not, you think it might not come, it's coming large city, small city, um, you need to know the NIMS, the National Incident Management System and its language. You can go to the FEMA website, look up training and then independent studies at no cost. Make sure your chaplain has the IS-100, the IS-230 and the IS-700 under his or her belt. They're free, but it's the language spoken on large scale events. When that plane crashes in your small community, your chaplain needs to know the language. When there's a mass shooting in your city of any size or your rural community of any size, they need to know the language because the big boys are coming and that's the only language they speak. Um, the Fallen Firefighters Foundation offers at no cost and again, across North America, they offer stress first aid courses. I would encourage your chaplain to make sure they have those that course, uh, at least the baseline in their toolbox to use. It helps our firefighters with pre-event 
uh, management. Keeps them healthy, keeps them strong, keeps them prepared to step into those tough situations without uh, the wheels coming off their wagon, so to speak, quite so easy. And then there is also the post-event um, training and for your chaplain when an event has played out and firefighters have just engaged those traumatic things that impact a family, uh, impact a, f- a firefighter. And then if he's impacted, it's his family, her family also. And that's our critical incident stress management, CISM. Um, defusings, debriefings, and that's a, t- a three-day course. Typically cost about 200, maybe two and a quarter for a, a fire department to send your chaplain to get that training. And again, those classes are offered across North America. Those three things, four things need to be in your chaplain's toolbox and ready to go at any time. Every agency should set up for their chaplain someone to be responsible for the chaplain. Who does the chaplain report to? He should not be an independent agent running amok. He should have someone to report to. As you know, fire agencies are a paramilitary organization. There's a hierarchy. The chaplain needs to fit in that and be responsible to someone. So you need to think, who would be good to watch over my chaplain program to make the chaplain accountable, to make them uh, enriched, to make them a better chaplain, and to make certain that if we need a liaison between the chaplain and the community or the chaplain and our agency, that person is who the chaplain can count on to help them on all of those levels as well as the agency can count on them. The next thing I want you to do is to create an SOG or an SOP for your chaplain, for your agency. We all know exactly what that is. That way, we're all on the same page. We know what to expect from our chaplain. We know what our chaplain can expect from us. There's no question. There's no gray area. We know what we're going to provide for him or her, and we know what they will provide for us. And then the third part of that uh, accountability component is that your chaplain should belong to a a local chaplain organization, one that creates expectations one that has a code of ethics, and one that requires them to have a measure of accountability. Because if you are like most agencies, we don't know how to train a chaplain and we don't know how to keep them accountable. So local uh, fire agency, fire department agency, chaplains groups are around. They're in almost every community or every region of the Northwest and of North America. Okay, should the chaplain really be a member of our fire department? Or do we want to just keep them sort of in the, you know, back in the shadow? We don't want to make a big deal. Let me, uh, uh, let me answer that for you. Really, the answer is simple. You see it on your screen? It's yes. Make that chaplain part of your department. Make them a regular part of your agency. It will, it will develop a sense of fellowship and a sense of um, accountability, both with the chaplain and agency personnel. They'll recognize the chaplain as part of who they are, someone that's been vetted, someone that is clearly free to participate at any level that the agency has designed. And it's not a secret society of chaplains hidden away, but they are a part of the uh, fire department that you serve in. The next thing is that it that, uh, makes them available to, <laughs> to sit under the umbrella of your agency's insurance. You want that chaplain covered, especially if he's driving to the scene, if he's on scene, or maybe he or she says says something that someone is offended at or whatever. You you can make a list as as long as a mile, but under your insurance as an agency, they're protected under all those clauses. So make sure that they are a member of your fire department and identified as such. And then it allows that chaplain to be identified to the public as part of a bona fide department Uh, He's accountable to someone. He's accountable to an organization that the community respects. The community looks up to a fire department and they say, there's a chaplain. He's been vetted. He's part of uh, that agency and we respect him because of that. Another benefit to making certain the chaplain is part of your agency is to see to it that they receive uh, a compensation if compensation is made available to your volunteers or to a career staff if they're a career chaplain, but make sure that they are compensated. Uh, If you've been around the fire service very long, you know that a a scene uh, plays out and it concludes within about 30 minutes at the most if it's a uh, medical scene. That chaplain will often be on scene for three or four hours. We want to make sure that their time is valuable as well. So if you're giving points or financial compensation, whatever, to your... um, 
to your line personnel, make sure your chaplain is also included in that. He's well-trained. She's well-trained. They're working really hard for what they do. And that chaplain also must fit within each state's confidentiality laws. They're very clearly defined, and each state defines them somewhat differently. So make certain that the confidentiality component that you all work under is also uh, very clear to them, as well as chaplains also for certain states fit under the clergy confidentiality rules. And so that chaplain, uh, if he hears or she hears certain things, they can hold those, those pieces confidential. And, and in your SOP or SOG, when you create that, make sure that that's understood clearly within that document, that the chaplain is a confidential component of your agency, so the personnel have a freedom to speak to them um, at those levels. And it will make a healthy relationship between what you hope your chaplain will provide to your folks and what they won't. How do I get a hold of my chaplain? We need a chaplain. What do we do? Do I call him? Do I page him? Do I ask dispatch to ring him up? Whatever you do, you need to find a mechanism that is clear, that is a communication that everyone understands they should use. It should be without uh, any foggy area. Some agency, well, we call our chaplain on the phone. I lost his number. Bummer. Figure it out and make certain that your chaplain can expect to be notified through that channel. Your personnel know to use that channel when they are requesting a chaplain. Make it clear and well-defined for everyone to know. So where do we find a chaplain? Is he a mild-mannered you know, <laughs> newspaper reporter hiding under a hat and behind big glasses? Where do we find him? Is he on the corner, tucked away? Um, where do we find this person? What do we expect from them? Ask your agency personnel. Go there. Say, do you know someone that might be able to live in the environment we live in, see the things we see, smell the things we smell, uh, see the things that scare us, and not tip over their apple cart personally? We need those people that have some kind of a uh, just innate part of their being that is able to manage that. We can help them, we can train them, but they need to have some built-in characteristics along that line. Um, if you can't find those people, maybe your personnel don't know them, then ask them maybe to go look at the local clergy. Maybe it's someone out there that could have some training, maybe some exposure to the emergency services world somewhere in their life. We can help them, we can train them. One of the questions that are asked uh, often is, does my chaplain need to be licensed or ordained? That question is answered by every agency independent of any other agency. In other words, if you want your chaplain to be licensed and ordained, say so. State that in your SOG. Make certain it's clear. If you want them to cover certain depths of training, East Coast, West Coast, trainings are different sometimes different um, religious bents are stronger in parts of our geography than others, and you would like your chaplain to fit that box more so than this box. That's up to you. Geographically, write your SOG, write that SOP so that it is all inclusive as you see it best to fit your agency. You know, you see on your screen the picture of Lone Ranger and Tonto. My statement is really this, no one should ride alone not your agency personnel, not when they face the things they face, not citizens, not community members when they face the things they face. They should not ride alone. And you know, your chaplain is that, that great piece, that great component, the depth and the richness of what your agency can provide to its own people and to the citizenry in which you serve. But again, no one should ride alone.